Well, we do come to you tonight, Father, as children of God through faith in Jesus Christ, through his death, burial, and resurrection, which was his work, his mission, was to ultimately accomplish the freedom for the human race from the slavery of sin. He did actually accomplish that, Father, before he said, it is finished, tetelestai, it is complete, and he gave up his spirit. Pray tonight, Father, you give us insight and understanding about these things. Pray tonight you give us understanding about the world in which we live. Help us understand what's going on around our nation, Father, and, and beyond into the world. And, and the things that seem to be so frightening and difficult. Give us common sense, Father, tonight in Christ's name. Amen. The incarnation and life of Christ is the most unique and important gift given to the human race. There's nothing more unique than the incarnation. In fact, there's nobody who's ever lived, I submit, that understands the incarnation. I don't know how it, I don't know how it can be. I don't know how somebody who pre-existed, who, who has lived for all eternity, a person, God the can also become another person in the womb and become one person. Of course, the answer is he didn't become a, he didn't, there wasn't two persons joined together. It was one person who took on a human nature, a hum, took on humanity in addition to his divine nature. That's how it works. But see, for us, it's so different. We come out of that. Every bit of us comes out of that, and whatever else God adds to us as Neshama comes. In Genesis, oh, you got your expert right back there. But I don't, I, I try to relate to that in a personal way, and it's very difficult for me to see one person who's always existed, and now there's another person in the womb, and they're the same person, and yet they're, anyway. That's called a hypostatic union. Having agreed to execute the eternal plan of redemption by limiting his deity, we call that kenosis, talked about it last time, he became the God-man, which is undiminished deity and true humanity in one person forever. He joined his divine personhood with mankind. He was born with a human body and soul. The fact that he would come down from his lofty place and become humanity is called the condescension, condescension, which is stooping from his highest position to become lower than angels. So he came and took the form of a servant. Now, do you realize what a great gift that is? If the king of kings stooped to become a lower than the angels to become a servant to you and I, and washed their feet as a symbol, how much more you and I to wash each other's feet. And this Christmas, you ought to be washing feet, at least, at least figuratively. <laughs> you wouldn't want to wash my feet, I can tell you that. i tell you something I've learned. As you get older and older, your feet look weirder and weirder. Have you noticed that? <sighs> they do. I remember Ron told me that, you know, I, I said one time, years, years ago, I said, well, I don't know if I'll ever have trouble cutting my own toenails. He said, oh, you just wait and see. He's dead gum right. I can't even get to him anymore. <laughs> you know, you got to be able look here, you got to be able to see on the other side of them to get down there. I can't get down there anymore. I apologize. I'm losing my voice. And uh, Now, Jesus took the form of a servant, adding to his divine personhood a human nature. And the miracle of the virgin birth is not the birth, it's the conception. Through his miraculous conception, he was born as a human baby with a perfect body, soul, and spirit. And you can read it in Matthew 26, 12, Matthew 26, 38, and 27, 50. Now, I want to talk briefly about the virgin birth and establish it as some principles here as a doctrine because it is critical to his ability to be the Savior it was prophesied in, Mi in Micah 5, 2 that he would come out of Bethlehem and that the Bethlehem would produce a ruler, the king of the Jews, 
who would rule, he was to be the ruler out of eternity. He's the eternal ruler of Israel. And of course, this is where the wise men inquired of Herod and they found this prophecy and they said, where is he supposed to be born? And they said, Bethlehem. Now in Isaiah 7, 14, we have the prophecy of the virgin shall conceive and give birth and that this, this baby that comes will be the savior of the world. This is what the angel told Joseph. You shall call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And not only those people, the Jews, but all people. Now the means of the virgin birth we find in Luke 1. And if you'll go with me to verse 26. Uh, now about the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth. And he was sent to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Coming in, he said, Hail, favored one, the Lord is with you. She was greatly troubled at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this might be and literally who this might be that was salutating her. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found great favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb, bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great, will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end, Mary said. Now, look, this is some pretty lofty stuff, right? Uh, yeah, he will be great, the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. Reign over the house of Jacob. Listen, you evoke Jacob's name. You might as well evoke Abraham's name. H whose star was this star? Did the star start out to be? Star, star of Jacob. Became the star of Jesus. And so... Mary said, and but look, Mary blew past all that stuff. You know, listen, here's what she heard, and I don't blame her. You know, look, I don't blame her. She, she said, uh, what's this about conception part? What's this conception part? Uh, how, how is this going to happen since I'm a virgin? Now, we don't know how old she is, but she knows she has had the birds and bees talk. And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit Here's what I'm after here is the mechanics. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. For that reason, the holy offspring shall be called the Son of God. So we, we go on and he, go, he talks about Elizabeth as, as evidence of this very same thing. And look, you got two births right together, two conceptions right together, miracles. Elizabeth is beyond this. She's beyond a uh, childbearing age, and yet she's become pregnant. So, she, she, she who is called barren is now in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. Now, he appears to Mary and says, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you in some way and overshadow you. What literally happened is the Holy Spirit provided 23 male chromosomes that fertilized the pure egg that Mary was carrying. Now, the Bible doesn't teach this, but it teaches this by implication out of Romans 5.12 and by the fact that, that the virgin birth produced a perfect human being who was minus Adam's original sin or the sin nature. The fact that through the woman's cycle her egg is able to remain pure and free from the contamination of Adam's original sin and the sin nature. It's the only thing on the earth that's not tainted, the woman's egg. Only thing on the earth. So the Holy Spirit provides the, the listen, the perfect male genetics for perfect female genetics combines that to create a perfect person, perfect human being, perfect in every way. Now, the Bible says that if he had gone to Hollywood, he'd have had to play a bad guy because he wasn't much pretty to look at. 
you know, Brad Pitt could never play Jesus. So I'm sure he's upset about that. But uh, we've got a perfect person, and the Holy Spirit is providing the genetics. From the point of conception, which is the miracle here, accomplished by the Spirit, her pregnancy and delivery were normal. Okay, we don't have any indication that the pregnancy and the delivery were, any, were, were miracles or anything different than a normal uh, pregnancy and delivery, except, of course, in the, in the barn. She delivered in the barn. So the Spirit is going to come upon her, and his power will overshadow her. And this is the generation of the 23 cells, and this is what we think of as the virgin conception. This is the means of God getting this done because nothing's impossible with him. What is it you need done? What is it you need done? Is it impossible? Not it. Not is it. Now, the virgin birth had its limitations uh, by, in the sense, as I spoke earlier, about the, per, the generation of the body of Christ, of Jesus in Mary's womb, was not the beginning of a new person, uh, as it is with other human beings. And, of course, you've got the generation of a new body, and what we think of as a format soul, which is, which is like the beginning of a soul, all the pieces of the soul, and then Neshama hits that soul and makes it, uh, and brings it to life, and everything's operational. Uh, all of that went on in the womb of Mary, and yet his personhood as God the Son already existed. So whether he was in the womb as God the Son joined with the fetus or not, I don't know. We're not told that. But he, he, you're not creating a new person. This was my struggle with the hypostatic union for years. It's like how can one existing person combine with another new person to make one person? Well, it's not two persons. It's that in the, in the womb what was generated was a, was a human body and nature for the person of God the Son. And Kenosis says that he limited himself to what a baby in the newborn baby would be able to do and yet was holding the universe together at the same time. No. Okay. See, I, I, I run out of words. I run out of, I run out of mind. My mind is really good until a point, and then it has little funny places that it goes, and it's like, you know, one of those uh, halls where you can't get out of, hall of mirrors or whatever, and it just, that's what the hypostatic union does to my mind. I do got to go there. But he was the divine person in eternity past who joined with a human body, soul, spirit, nature to become the God-man. And listen, his, here's what's amazing to me. Not that he just did that. We have a creation of creatures before us called angels that are more powerful, more, more smart, more brilliant, greater creatures than we are, and yet he never joined himself to one of them. And yet he joined himself to humanity, and this is forever. God the Son is going to be a man forever. We're going to be able to relate to him and see him in his humanity, glorified humanity, forever. He favored the human race. He favored us over angels. Now, that might have what made Satan mad. I don't know. It was part of it, wasn't it? Yeah, it was part of it. You know, this guy, this guy Lucifer, he had some unrealistic expectations, apparently. I mean, he was expecting some things from God in eternity past. He had a high position. If you study Ezekiel 28, when he speaks to him, he, was, he, he says all these things about him, and he had this high position in the plan of God, the economy of God in eternity past, and none of it was enough. 
Sounds like Eve in the garden. None of it was enough. And that's, listen, listen, it sounds like Christmas, doesn't it? Never enough. Never enough. Never enough. You know, you asked me about that. Sunday night I went to uh, Liberty Community Church with Jeff Deloach. And quite a few people we know were there, Peggy and the Baxter uh, family and people that we know very well. And I spoke, and it was really hard. They had little kids in there. And you can't, listen, They've all, you always hear as a speaker, you can't compete with little kids. You just cannot compete with little kids. Everything I would say, this little one-year-old kid back there would go, ah. <laughs> I'd say something, he'd go, ah. I know. I told Rhonda, I said, that's my last time. I mean, I, you know. I, I, I told him, he said, I think he agrees. I think he agrees. But anyway, uh, I found myself getting a little frustrated with the whole situation. I sat there listening to the next speaker, and he was very, very, very well done, and Jim Jeff spoke. And the Lord, I was talking to the Lord, he said, you know, you're so easily frustrated. You're so easily frustrated. How is it your happiness is still connected to your circumstances? How is it that your happiness is still tied so heavily that you can't even break free to be in fellowship with me because of circumstances? Jeez. Anyway, where'd that come from? Importance of the virgin birth. It allowed Christ to be born without the effects of Adam's sin. This is the imputed condemnation in the old sin nature, which he could not have had and been a perfect person. Had he been judged and condemned under Adam's original sin, he would not have qualified to go to the cross to be a righteous sacrifice. He had to bypass that. This is why we believe the virgin birth is the bypass of, of the male genetics. Adam and Eve were created perfect. Jesus developed perfect humanity in the womb, lived a perfect human life, had a perfect human body. We're going to see tonight he had a perfect human development. He had to be truly human to represent humanity on the cross to pay for the sins of the world. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, the Bible says he was made lower than angels that he might taste death for every man. For those of you who have bought into an idea of limited atonement, that passage says every man, and I know that those who believe in limited atonement find a way to change the meaning of the words to mean every doesn't mean every. The world doesn't mean all the, you know, he, he not only paid for our sins, 1 John 2, 2, but the sins of the whole world, which you think would kind of just say it, but when you translate the word world as those that God has chosen, you, you anyway, you know, it's just, yeah, mm-hmm. You talking about reform theology? No, 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 no. No, that's the, what you're talking about. There is, uh, yeah, it's a different thing. This is for those who believe that that God chose who would be saved, and predetermined that they would be saved, and He picked out who He wanted, and He 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 only calls those to be saved. The rest of us are out of luck. Yeah, it's five point Calvinism. Yeah. Well, that's another deal that comes out of the Jehovah's Witness and all that kind of stuff, you know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> bit of ground is going to be in the tribulation. Here you go. Yeah. He's going to be an old man, ain't he? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you too, Horton. <laughs> Horton's going to be one too. Anyway. He is our mediator. You know, if you're watching us online, we like to have a little fun every now and then. Sometimes it gets away from us or it gets away from me. And uh, 
In 1 Timothy 2, 5, we have one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. He's also had to be humanity to share David's, to sit on David's throne and rule in his, uh, the throne of Jacob forever. Now, I want to make a footnote here. Since we're talking about these miraculous births, there's a lot of press out there for people who read a translation of the Bible and say that John the Baptist was filled with the Spirit inside of his mother's womb. Have you heard that? That he had the Holy Spirit in the womb. Well, if you'll turn with me to Luke chapter 1, verse 15, I'm going to share with you my view of it. Gabriel in chapter 1, verse 15 is talking to Zacharias, and he's explaining who John was going to be. Luke 1, 15, he says, For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will drink no wine or liquor. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is the New American Standard which normally is great, but while yet in his mother's womb, while yet, now let me read the NIV. The NIV says he won't take wine or drink and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Who's, who's got the NIV that says even from birth? Yeah. Let me tell you what you got there. You should see it on your paper. Uh, it's the second line under John the Baptist. It says... Eti, even, which is an adverb of time showing emphasis. Then you have the preposition ek. What's ek mean? Out from. Out from his mother's womb. So the phrase out from his mother's womb literally means from the moment that he comes out of his mother's womb. He's out. The preposition, if, if the writer had wanted to say that the spirit was going to fill him while in the womb, there's a preposition called en. In. In means in, right? Now, there's another one, which is uh, ice, which means into. You go into, and then there's ek, which means out from, okay? My personal belief is based on the Greek of this passage. He had the Holy Spirit as after he was born, after he emerged from the womb. So uh, this adverb of time provided for emphasis and to indicate when the Spirit would be given. Preposition act out from indicates a separation from. It's his main for, it's its main meaning. It means separation. After he had been separated from his mother's womb, the ministry of the Spirit was not given to him until he was born and separated ek from his mother's womb. Now turn over to chapter one, verse forty through forty-four, and we'll see another passage that is also used. I think misused, misunderstood. In chapter 1, verse 40, talking about John the Baptist, Mary entered the house of, you know, when Mary, when, when Gabriel left Mary, she was really in a tizzy, and rightly so. She gets up, she goes in and packs a little bag and runs off to uh, uh, Aunt Elizabeth. Was that her aunt or her cousin? Aunt, Aunt Elizabeth? Yeah, Aunt Elizabeth. And, uh, and look, when she walks in the door, and it came about in verse 41, now wait, in verse 40, she entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. Now, a Jewish greeting in the first century might have been a little more than hello. This might have been more of a, you know, hey, Aunt Elizabeth, I'm here to come see you, you know, blah, blah, blah. Anyway. And it came about when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped or leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Now this is old covenant filling. Not new covenant filling, old covenant filling. It's a different word. She cried out with a loud voice and said, Blessed among women are you, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. In other words, she already knows what's going on in Mary. How is it, how, and how has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in the womb, in my womb, leapt for joy. Now, when you read that, you think the baby in her womb heard the greeting, was overjoyed that Jesus was there inside of Mary, and he was just couldn't wait to get out to meet him, right? The baby. Now, I want to give you a little different idea here. But see, those who believe that John the Baptist was indwelt, spirit filled with the spirit in the womb, they tell you, well, look, he had the Holy Spirit in the womb. And you're saying that he can't hear this greeting and respond to it? And I'm going to say, well, he would be the very first six-month-old fetus in the womb that ever was developed enough to cognitively, <laughs> cognitively understand who this was and what was going on and respond to it that way. But that's kind of interesting to me. But anyway, let me show you a few other things here. that It came, it, it came about when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting. Who heard the greeting? Elizabeth did. Does it say the baby heard the greeting? Now, here's something that's interesting, too. For those who wonder what, what the Bible calls things in the womb, because Jesus in Matthew, in the neuter, but look, this, he, uh, it came about in verse 41, and it came to pass when, she, when uh, Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby, you know what it's called? The brephos. The brephos in the womb. That's interesting, isn't it? That's a baby. That's a baby on the, that's a nursing baby, a, a newborn. And he's not born yet, and he's already being called a brephos. Just throwing it out there for whatever that means. I'm not going to draw the implications, but. It was Elizabeth who heard Mary's greeting, not the baby, not the brephos in the womb. It was Elizabeth who responded with joy when hearing Mary's voice because she knew the story. It was Elizabeth's own excitement that caused the baby to react and move in the womb. Now, I've never been pregnant but I have felt babies move in the womb. Oh. One that kicked Rhonda really bad, but probably both of them. They're kicking her worse now, but uh, <laughs> you trust me on that. Uh, years ago, Bob Thiem did that, and he called it reflex motility or something, but the, the and I looked up that term, but I couldn't find that term. Uh, it's not a stretch to realize that that Elizabeth is in a very excited state. I mean, not only is she pregnant herself at a, at a end stage with John the Baptist, all these promises about who these people are going to be. Now she hears having conceived and is in her niece Mary. Now she's here, and they're about to discuss it, and she's like, whoa, this is just way too much, and she's way excited. And the baby moved. And she calls it the baby leapt for joy. Call it how you want to. I say to you, Elizabeth heard Mary, and the baby responded to the mother's excitement. Anyhow. Now, John the Baptist was not filled with the Holy Spirit womb. He was filled with the Holy Spirit out from the womb. Now, as you know, the body of Christ, the humanity of Christ, was generated and from 
genetic cells created by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit generates 23 male chromosomes with a pure egg in Mary's womb to create a perfect human being. Now, since none of us have ever known or met a perfect human being, we have to ask ourselves a question. What would it be like to not be born under Adam's original sin or born with a sin nature? What would it be like to be born minus an old sin nature? What would it be like to be born with a nature, a tendency, just a natural tendency and move toward God rather than toward self and sin? What if your natural tendency was not to struggle with God but to work with God, to cooperate and surrender? What if that was what was natural? What's for him? What's for him? See, it's important in my mind, especially next week, we'll talk about the gift of transformation, the gift of of Christ, the gift of the uh, life that God has given to us in this life of being able to live out Christ in you, the hope of glory. In you, that's going to be the final gift that I'm going to discuss. This is the gift of his life, his information. And what I'm an expert in is human development. I mean, I'm a... I'm a psychologist with a degree and all that, and I'm an expert in human development. I've studied it upside down. I know a lot about it. So I want to share with you from that standpoint his own personal development. So the Holy Spirit provided perfect male genetics, formed a perfect body, and a perfect human being in Mary's womb. Everything developed perfectly. Everything was right on time. You know, he sucked his thumb at the right time. Uh, how aware babies are in the womb is up for grabs, but they're beginning to see through all kinds of uh, imagery that we can now do that there's quite a lot that goes on in the womb, whether, whether there's Neshama or not, but there's a lot going on in there. In the womb, Jesus experienced perfectly healthy human development. At birth... He was healthy in every possible way. Every possible way. I mean, he was, it doesn't tell us how big he was. I mean, how big do you think he was? Nine pounds and 18, you know, whatever. I bet he was a whopper. You know, I bet he was a whopper. He was healthy. He was strong. He was perfect. Now, on Mary, Mary was praying that he'd be like five pounds, you know, but... Joseph was thinking, no, no, I want to see the big boy, carpenter. Let me talk about human growth. There are normal stages of human development that he went through. I don't, again, I don't understand how God the Son, who comes out of eternity past, who is the creator of the universe, who holds it together with his word of power, can be a baby in the manger and know nothing, who God is omniscient in the one hand, but actually knows nothing as a baby at the same time. I don't know how that works, but I do know it is what the Bible teaches. So I can't explain that to you, but I do know it's what is taught. So there's about, there's depending on who you study, there's basically four stages. Uh, you're in Luke, are you still in Luke? Turn over to chapter 2, verse 40. Uh, in fact, you're in Luke 1. Go to Luke 1, verse 80 for the first verse. This Luke 1, 80 talks about John the Baptist. And the child continued to grow, to become strong in spirit. He lived in the desert until the day of his public appearance to Israel. So he continued to grow. If you go to Luke chapter 2, verse 40, we'll see Jesus. And the child kept on growing. All these are continuous action verbs. When it comes to spiritual growth or human growth, you're to keep on growing. 
The child kept on growing. He kept on becoming strong, being filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him, or the favor of God, the approval of God might be the idea here. You know, he says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This is his favor. Now, there's a stage of growth from about zero from birth to about two years old. Is, you know, you could break these down even more, but for our purposes to understand what he went through, I want you to just follow this. To from zero to two, the Bible calls a brephos or even a napios. These are all Greek words to in the New Testament describe different levels of human growth. This is a baby. And in from zero to two, there's, there's uh, a baby's not normally talking yet. I mean, they're beginning to talk, what, uh, 18 months? They start to talk, blah, 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 blah. Uh, like this little guy, Sunday night, he was, he was really wanting to talk. Uh, but <laughs> he couldn't talk yet. It, but Gary was probably saying amen. I think he was saying amen, yeah. Just in his own little language. Uh, the word napios means not speaking, literally. So this is a child at an age that's not yet speaking. From two to five is what we call the toddler phase. This is a pice, and this is where children are learning to walk. They're learning to talk. They're learning to do all kind of developmental tasks, uh, but they're not yet ready for real training. This is, you know, from zero to two, by the way, Ron has developed a wonderful book that is online. You can get a copy of it about child rearing. And uh, if you're going to, I see everybody in here mostly going to have grandchildren. Uh, maybe one couple could have children. But uh, you need to understand these things. So it's like from zero to two years old, you don't spank. You don't spank. You use all different kinds of. You know, at the most, you just, you know, you, you don't, uh, you know, they're not, re they're not ready for training in that way. You redirect, you do all kinds of stuff to keep them out of trouble, uh, but they're not, listen, they're not able to comprehend the lesson of spanking yet. So it would be of no benefit and only harm them. Two to five, this is very light discipline. Uh, toddler phase, uh, terrible twos, terrible threes. You may have to start uh, creating limitations. You know why they get really mad and angry? Because you tell them no. If you don't want them to get mad at you, then don't tell them no. And when they're 18 years old, then they'll tell you no. And uh, you'll be so happy with that outcome. But... This is the toddler from age 5 or 6 to 13 is what we call the technon. Uh, actually, this goes up to 21, but this is where you begin to the real training. This is where kids start to school. They go to kindergarten, first grade, second grade. Uh, this is where discipline is a daily part of their life. This is where they begin to learn uh, really advanced ideas. Their body is now developed where they can walk and talk and function. Uh, run and play and do these all kinds of things. And finally, from age 13 to 21, at the age 21, adulthood. But in the Jewish culture, age 13 was an adult. Listen, age 13, a boy was ready to apprentice. He's ready to go to work. He's ready to make a living. He may still live at home, but he's ready to apprentice with his father. And I, I believe that's what Jesus did with Joseph. He apprenticed as a He began to contribute to the family income and take care of his brothers and sisters and do all the things at age 13. They didn't have teenage years like we do. They didn't have the luxury of the, of the wealth. It takes wealth to be able to let people wait till they're 25 years old to produce anything. They had to survive. Now... Each stage of development is for developing specific skills, and each stage has the goal of mastering these skills and tasks. For instance, from zero to two, 
a baby is learning to walk, to get up and balance himself and be able to get around. That's his, that's his goal. That's the, that's the job that he's given. Learn to walk. Begin to learn to talk. These are developmental uh, goals and, and job. This is his job. You know how kids learn? They learn by play. They play constantly. They want to play constantly. And their play is how they develop. Their play is how they develop strength. It's how they develop socially. It's, it's play. And, and if you're wise and smart and talented, you can take all their learning and turn it into a game. Have a great time with them. So the early stages of development are primarily physical with the latter stages of development focusing on mental and belief systems. Their early stage, listen, they, they're before age 10 to 13, children are concrete. Now, I don't mean, as Gary says, all mixed up and firmly set. Uh, concrete means that they can't really understand something unless they see a physical representation of it. They have to have an image, something they can touch. So you take an eight-year-old and try to describe a concept, justification. They can't, their brain is not developed enough to grasp that, not really. They may say they do, but they can't personalize any of that uh, at that age. Around 12 or 13, you'll notice their conversation will switch. They'll begin to be interested in things like the world and government and politics. Uh, that's when Zach began to talk about, well, how does this work, Pop? You know, how, how, do we get the, how do we get that president? Oh, no, how do we get that president, you know? And uh, anyway, uh, but this is when your brain develops enough and your brain stop developing till even up to 25. <laughs> and then it's just a short while after that, the thing starts going downhill quickly. I mean, it's just like a short stage. Now, once you hit the ability to conceptualize in the teen years, the goal has to do primarily, you're still developing physically, you're developing strength, your body's developing, women, of course, for childbearing and all those things, uh, puberty brings in men as well, but the focus is on your thinking and your beliefs. The focus is on your belief system. This is where your belief system is being developed where you are programming your own heart with what you're going to think and feel, say, and do throughout your life. This is the time of life when those core ideas are programmed into you. And the way that God designed us was to look around us at our caretakers, our caregivers, and emulate them, often the same with peers, to, to, to draw examples and information and insight from around us to form our own. We're, we're copiers. We're mimics. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, it says, imitate Christ as dearly beloved children. As dearly beloved children imitate their parents, we're to imitate God. So they become imitators. Christ, listen, Jesus in his humanity was no different. Can you imagine how great these two guys were, Joseph and Mary? That, that God the Father would put them in the, Jesus in their life for him to emulate? I mean, what a man Joseph had to be. I would love to be a man like that. I'd love to be a man with that much integrity and honor that God would entrust me with his own son. Gee whiz. But, you know, he did entrust me with his children. And that's a heavy burden sometimes. But anyway, Jesus was indwelt and filled with the Spirit and, and had unhindered contact with his Father every moment of his life. 
this is what you need to understand. What I want you to see in this next 10 minutes is the difference between Christ, Jesus Christ and you and I. You and I are born spiritually dead. We're born under Adam's original sin, condemned to the lake of fire. We must have a Savior or we're going to end up in the lake of fire. Our natural tendency with the sin nature indwelling every cell of our body is to put me first. Me people. That's what the sin nature does to you. It puts it makes you it causes you to see me and what I want and what I feel. That's the primary. I become the center of everything. Everything's about me. So everything I learn and everything I develop is all about promoting me, getting me what I want, defending me, protecting me promoting me, saving my reputation, keeping me out of trouble. Everything's about me. With Christ, Jesus, his human nature, which was perfect, was tuned toward God. Toward God. He naturally leaned toward God. Wouldn't that be nice? Would you like that? Well, look, you've got that nature now. You do know that, right? You've got that nature now. You just may not be nurturing it very much. But now, spiritually dead humanity, born with a sin nature, goes through stages of human development while being influenced by the devil who uses the world system to corrupt our beliefs about self, God, others, life, etc. Look. The devil doesn't have to appear into your home to corrupt your thinking. He has already created a system of philosophy and thinking and beliefs in a way of thinking about life we call the world system. Just, just, just turn on the TV. Turn on the TV. You know, I wonder, you know, I remember before we had TV, in my parents' house. I remember when Dad brought that thing in. We thought, what is that? And it was pretty neat when those pictures came on there. You know, and we watched Barney and Andy and, you know, Leave it to Beaver. And we all got all these good moral, you know. And then one day, MTV came on. <laughs> and it ain't been the same since, I'll be honest with you. But... The devil has created a system of influence that has something for everybody. If you're a religious, if you're an ascetic, you say, well, my, my trend is asceticism. I can't stand all these frivolous people that go out and just do nothing but have fun. They laugh all the time and drink and smoke and cuss and fuss and everything. I just can't stand I like order and I like everything to be neat and and, uh, you know, respectful and moral. Well, the Lord's got a plan for you as well. It's called religion. He's got a religion that will fit your particular uh, tendencies just perfectly. If you're a lascivious, if you're a lascivious person, hey, he's got a whole program for you that's very obvious. This is where we get influenced. We get influenced by our peers, parents, peers, and we begin developing our own ideas that we believe. I'll do this again next time, but this is important to understand how ideas form. You've got a, a mind and you've got a heart. The mind's basic job is to perceive and understand circumstances and human events and phenomena. The goal here of the mind is to understand what's happening in your life. So every time there's an event in your life, you begin to analyze for the purpose of understanding it. You will ultimately reach some kind of conclusion about what just happened in your life and the conclusion X, if believed using your volition, X now comes over and becomes part of your heart, your conscience, your belief system, where 
this X here became X inside of you that you let into your soul, and now you believe X is true, and you're going to live your life based on the fact that X is true. Now, that's great if X is true. What if X is not true? Like from the world, what if all your X's are not from Texas? And you believe a bunch of garbage and pack that into your heart and operate on it in your life. That's what happens. Once you believe this conclusion, see, you use every resource available to you to evaluate this and try to understand it. And once you get to that conclusion phase, you decide whether you're going to believe it or not. If you don't, listen, if you don't believe it, then it remains in the mind as a theory that you never bought into. Master's degree in, quote, psychology. There was about a zillion theories I didn't buy into. Okay, I understand it. Give it to you on the test. Throw it away. All that stuff. And I, look, I can quote some of it today. But once you believe it, though, becomes part of you. Once it becomes part of you, you begin to apply it to your life. When you begin to apply it to your life, you know what it does? It becomes a habit. You habituate it. You do it over and over and over. And listen, by the time you've done it a number of times, you will have forgotten where that idea came from you will have forgotten that you ever believed it or why you believed it. You just know that's how you think and feel. And this becomes what we call automatic thinking. Once you turn it into a habit inside of you, you bought into it out here in the world. You believed it and put it in your heart. You applied it to life and you used it. It turned into a habit. You forgot that it was even there. You forgot why you feel that way. You just know that you do. You know that when that button is pushed, this behavior comes out. That when, when your dear partner tells you to turn here and turn there and watch out for this car and watch out for that car and to slow down and don't brake so fast and everything like that, and this little stupid thing in your soul that says, I don't like being told what to do. And here it goes. And you go, where does that come from? Where does that come from? I think that's the devil. The de that's where, that came from the devil. Now, do you understand that process? Every one of us are full of that stuff. This is called the old man belief system. That's why Paul says, look, you can't just learn, you can't just install the new man and forget that's there and to pretend it's not there and just focus here thinking that somehow that will either squeeze that out or just eliminate it. It won't. It, that thing's going to keep coming back and coming back and coming back and squirting out in your life in all kinds of ways. It's going to corrupt everything in your life. Look, you got to erase and replace. you got to get rid of that stuff. Jesus had none of that. None of it. Not one drop of it. Isn't that wild? Every step of his way, when he had to re evaluate what was going on, I mean, I think about him at the few, uh, with Lazarus who died, and he comes to the women, the sisters, and Martha meets him, and Lord, if you'd have only been here. And you know he would like to have said, I'm omnipresent. I was here. You know, he would. <laughs> he got so frustrated, he started weeping, you know, but he handled it beautifully, he handled it perfectly from divine perspective, divine viewpoint. Everyone there was edified because he was listening to a father he didn't go for three days. Everything was, everything in here was cooking with gas on all cylinders. We're not like that. 
Do you realize that? That when you get saved and you're filled with the Spirit for that moment, you're pure. For that moment, you can think like Christ. But you have so habituated so many wrong ideas that the moment you are distracted away from the Spirit, this has the gravitational pull of the sun. And it sucks you right back in. Boom. And you're in the flesh before you know it. And so what do you do? Back and forth. You like the two-step. You know, you're doing this little dance. You know who you're dancing with? Who are you dancing with? Not the devil. You're dancing with yourself. You're dancing with the old man. The new man's dancing with the old man. I don't know about you. But I never wanted to dance with any old man. I'd rather dance with my beautiful wife. I, uh... If you're interested in this, next week we'll get into that in a little deeper and explain what God has given us and the option and opportunity that we have in Christ to become people that literally are like him. So, this is, uh, let's close in prayer and then we'll have our prayer. Father, what a great privilege to understand just briefly in a very shallow way the soul of Jesus Christ, your son. I pray that you give us great understanding of him, that we could come to know him and grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm in awe of him. I'm in awe of what you set up in the virgin birth, in the perfect humanity, in the life that he lived, in the way he used his volition to reject everything the world had to offer. Every temptation was, he said no. And every time, he, he said yes to you every moment of his life, even when it meant a death on the cross that, that didn't belong to him, that wasn't because of him. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And I'm so grateful in Christ's name. Amen.